Hello everyone, welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Last time we began the book of Revelation, and uh, we made it through chapter 1, verse 16, so we'll pick it up in verse 17 today. If you can get your Bible, that would be great. Always best to follow along in your copy of the Bible as we study the word together verse by verse. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is another place where you can study the Bible verse by verse with me using my audio Bible messages. In fact, you can study through the Bible three complete series going from Genesis all the way through Revelation three times. Took me over 30 years. It's all there for you at the Bible verse by verse. Dot com. Just click and listen and study God's holy word, our greatest gift, next to Jesus, the living word, God's greatest gift to us here on earth today, the written word of God. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. As I said, we went through verse 16 of Revelation chapter 1 last time, but I want to begin reading in verse 10, and I think you'll see why. Of course, this is written by the Apostle John, who has been banished to a huge rock called the island of Patmos. He's there because he preached the word of God and he was faithful to Jesus. He's an old man, very old man. And notice what it says here in verse 10. John writes, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So you can imagine being on this island, probably by yourself, fellowshipping with God, meditating on Jesus, praying, just having a good time with the Lord, him and Jesus. And he hears this loud voice from behind him. I mean loud, sounds like a trumpet. And look at 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamum, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Now he knows who this is. Who else could it be? The risen, ascended Lord Jesus Christ. The one that he was so close to during his three plus years of ministry here on earth. And notice verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. And notice his description of Jesus. This isn't like the Jesus that was on the earth. One like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded about the breast with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine bronze, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance 
was as the sun shineth in its strength. And as I said last time, that is a vision of our King, of our Lord, and of our Savior. And as I also said last time, let that vision sink in, what John was looking at, and you will see that Jesus is no man's victim. And he's no devil's victim either. This is a picture of our all-powerful, all-wise, ever-present Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that next time you pray to him. This is who you're talking to. Verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And we learned from this that there are no tough guys in the presence of God. There are no smart alecks in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We learn from this that everyone who stands before Jesus will color in his presence. If John, who may have been his closest friend here on earth, fell as a dead man when he looked at him, imagine what it's going to be like for the unsaved, for those who have rejected him. Atheist will crumble before the Lord that they tried to deny. And even Christians, the forgiven, the very children of God through faith in Jesus Christ, are going to be overwhelmed in the presence of the Lord. But for the Christian, there's a huge difference. For the Christian, the initial fear will quickly melt away when Jesus tells us, like he told John, to be not afraid. While the wicked go from one level of fear to the next level of dread and horror to the next, Christians will experience joy and peace at the comforting words of the Son of God. 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen and have the keys of hell and death. You die when Jesus says you die. Not a second sooner. The Bible teaches the sovereignty of God, not the sovereignty of the devil or anyone else. It really doesn't matter what the details surrounding our life and death may be. God is the one who ultimately determines when we will die. Jesus holds the keys to death and hell. Verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And so the apostle was to be thorough in what he did for Jesus. We should always do what God says is correct. We should always do what God says is important. And we should always do it the very best that we can. 
we should always be as thorough as we possibly can be. That is what our Lord expects. That is what our Lord deserves. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. In other words, Jesus is in the midst of his churches. He was in this vision, and that's the point. Jesus is in the midst of his churches. And Jesus has his ministers, his messengers, referred to as angels, because that's what the word means, messengers in his hand. Sometimes I ask, sometimes, sometimes I ask, you have me in your hand, Lord? Even me? It's kind of mind-boggling to think about it. You know, I teach the Word of God. I'm His messenger. You even have me in your hand, Lord? Sometimes I think, well, there should be more visible results. And yet I cannot deny the Holy Word of God. So I continue to believe that God has me where he wants me to be, doing what he wants me to do. And I am fortunate because I know why I am on earth. There's a lot of people, I suppose, who, even Christians, who wonder what God's will is for me. I, I don't, or for them, you know. I, I don't have to wonder. I know. I know. It's God's will for me to teach his word. And as long as I'm doing that, I know he is in the midst. I know he's with me. And he's with all of us who know him. But I know what he wants me to do. I believe he has me doing what he wants me to do, where he wants me to do it, and the venues that are open for me to do it. He's in control of everything. He's in control of everything in your life, too, if you're a Christian. Jesus is with us, working in our lives. Let's go into chapter 2. Actually, let's read verse, um, yeah, let's go into verse 1 of chapter 2. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So these words are from Jesus, initially addressed to the pastor in the church of Ephesus, the leader. And notice what it says. These are the words of him. These are the words of him. John doesn't write, these are my words. He writes, these are the words of him. The minister, the Bible teacher, the pastor, is not to give his opinions or to read into the word of God something that is not there or teach something other than the Word of God. If you are a minister, then you must give the words of Him and make the words of Him clear and teach the words of Him. Not your own opinions, not that which will draw attention to you, God forbid. The minister was and is to communicate the Word of God to people. These are the words of Jesus. Look at them in verse 2. 
Jesus says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them who are evil. And thou hast tried them who say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. So there were people trying to influence the church in Ephesus, calling themselves apostles. Jesus says, you've looked at them. You know the criteria. You know they don't measure up. You know they're liars. And you don't, you don't allow them. And you don't show them any respect. And you don't tolerate them. And I've said it before, there are no apostles today. I know there are people who call themselves apostles. There, some in the Word of Faith movement even say that there are apostles today that are, are more significant than the 12. Totally false. There isn't a person alive today who meets the biblical criteria of an apostle laid out in Scripture. Of course, if you're running around saying, God showed me, I had a vision, God spoke to me, I had a dream, and that's your criteria, then that's not a problem. But it will be a problem on Judgment Day. False apostles leading people astray. They've been here since day one. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them who are evil, and thou hast tried them who say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. Jesus knows all the good things that we do. He is aware of the times that we do what is good, even when it is not easy. He knows when we keep on doing good, even though it would be much easier to quit. He knows about the times that we've done what is right, even though it made us unpopular. He is aware of all these things, and the Bible says that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Verse 3, And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. So they didn't get bored with doing what was right and quit. They didn't stop doing right when they found out that some people did not like it. They didn't compromise holiness even when it was hard work and they were tired and it would have been much easier just to satisfy their flesh by committing sin. They didn't do that. They persevered. They did a lot of good things. Jesus opens his letter to them with some wonderful commendations. I'd be thrilled to have Jesus say any of these things about me. But the letter isn't over. Notice verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And so we learn from this, that Jesus not only knows what we are doing and appreciates the fact that we are doing what is correct, but he also knows why we're doing it. And if our motive isn't a deep love for Jesus, that's not good. That's not right. Jesus knows that too. And what Christ is pointing out to these people is maybe something that they were not aware of because it can happen very subtly. They didn't feel about Jesus the way they used to. He knew that. Love and appreciation for Jesus makes serving Christ natural. And that's the way Jesus wants it to be. 
He does not want our obedience and our holiness and our service to him to be reduced to a list of religious guidelines. In other words, he doesn't want Christians to be legalistic. He wants us to live for him out of love and out of like, not out of a sense of duty. Jesus kept the requirements of the law for us. He fulfilled the law for us. He never sinned one time. He was absolutely sinlessly perfect and he did it for us so that his perfection could be credited to our spiritual account when we receive him as Lord and Savior. He kept the requirements of the law for us and he also kept the, re the requirements of the law that sins be paid for when he died on the cross to pay for our sins. And Jesus would like us to appreciate him for that and just naturally live to please him. He loved us. He wants us to love him back. And what did Jesus say about loving him? If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. And that's what was missing in the Ephesian church. Oh, they were obeying. But it wasn't out of a love for Jesus. They had allowed that to slip away. You say, well, what's the difference? Isn't the fact that they were doing the right thing the most important thing? Well, it was important, which is why Jesus commended them for doing the right thing. But God is as much concerned with our motives as he is with our actions. So notice verse 5. Jesus says, Remember, therefore. Notice, remember, therefore, from where thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Stop right there for a second. Do the things you did at first. In other words, get back to the mindset you had when you were first saved. You were excited about forgiveness. You were so happy when you learned that I died on the cross to pay for your sins and that I washed away your sins. You were so happy that you were justified. You were so happy that when God looked at you, he saw the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that you were cleansed. You were so happy that you were not going to hell. You were so grateful for how good Jesus had been, been to you to suffer and die for your sins like he did. And when you read the Bible, it was to learn about Jesus. When you prayed, it was because you wanted to talk to him, because you could talk to him. You had a Savior, and you had a Lord, but more than that, you had a friend, a good friend, who accepted you, flaws and all, and it made your love for Jesus skyrocket. And that's what Jesus wants us to be like. He wants us to be like that, to have that first love for him. Because you know why? Not only is it the correct motive for everything that we do, but when we lose that, it's the first step toward apostasy. We need to guard that. So notice five again. Remember therefore, from where thou art fallen, and repent. We need to repent if we lose that first love. Repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy lampstand out of its place, except thou 
repent. In other words, your spiritual light is going to be put out. We're no witness for Christ if we don't love and appreciate Jesus. People are looking for real. And if Jesus is not real to us, then we're not going to be able to testify to the unsaved about their need for Jesus Christ. Your deep love for Jesus will cause some people to think you're crazy. You're a religious nut. You're a fanatic. They don't understand. Forget it. Just leave them be. They will believe what they want to believe. But if somebody is open for truth, it's not compromising with the world that will draw them to Christ. It's not being like the world and being cool in the eyes of the world that'll make them interested in Jesus. That's a modern day evangelical belief. And it's totally wrong. And yes, they can get a lot of people to their worldly churches and their worldly rock groups and all their other kind of worldly stuff. Yeah, they can draw people. It's all flesh. It has nothing to do with Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. I don't care what they say. It has nothing to do with Jesus. It is your deep, deep love for Jesus and your holiness that the Holy Spirit uses to witness for Christ to bring conviction of sin upon the unsaved, along with the preaching of God's word against sin and preaching about hell too, by the way. You better believe it. Loving Jesus and the truth of God's word is the key to being used by Jesus. But our love for Jesus is what gives our witness light and power. Verse 6, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And you know what? I, there's disagreement as to who the Nicolaitans were, and theologians sit and debate this kind of stuff all the time. I couldn't care less. I don't know who the Nicolaitans were or what they did, because Jesus doesn't tell us. And if he doesn't tell us, guess what? I don't care. Why talk about it? Why think about it? Why discuss about it? Why argue about it? Let's stick to the Word of God, okay? I don't care who they were. I don't care what they did. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that the Ephesians hated what Jesus hated. That's the important thing. God is happy when you hate the unscriptural trash that is passed off in some places as a sermon. God is happy when you hate the spiritual entertainment that is passed off in some places as a sermon or as worship music. God is happy when you hate that kind of rot. God is happy when you hate what is wrong in the world. And he is happy when you hate sin and have the guts to say it isn't right. Hate what Jesus hates phoniness in the church, entertainment that replaces sermons, entertainment, fleshly lust and fleshly, fleshly satisfaction that replaces true worship. Hate it and you'll be okay. Hate what Jesus hates. Seven, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of of the garden. In other words, if you overcome, you'll enjoy forever. Faith in Jesus Christ gives us eternal life. Persevering in that faith to the very end proves that that faith is genuine. We have to persevere to the end to be saved. And I'm out of time. Continue studying with me in the same manner at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. And if you want to be a part of this ministry, be sure to pray for me, would you? And also click the donate button at the top of the front page at the BibleVerseByVerse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. That's at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Join me again next time. We'll pick it up in verse 8. Until then, so long, everyone.